be here, and uh, I want to encourage any of you to ask questions at any time as we go through. Um, so northern New Mexico, in fact, New Mexico in the southwest, I love it. I've, I've kicked around there for a long time, here for a long time, and I hope to um, convey some of that to you. One of the things I do want to emphasize, especially for the younger people who are here, is that many of the problems that we face as a society today are earth science based. And so if you're interested in earth science, there's a need for people to go into the field and there are a whole variety of opportunities. It can be planetary science, that now qualifies as earth science. If you study Mars, we, we count that as earth science. It all gets folded together. And I have colleagues who, who work, they're not on Mars, but they're actually working on directing the rover, for example, right now. That's all Earth science. Uh, certainly, alternative energy is partly Earth science. Natural resources of all sorts, groundwater is a big one. That's Earth science. And there's all different kinds of directions you can go with what we broadly sort of call geology. I think now we tend to call it more Earth science. But um, I'm not specifically going to talk about those kinds of opportunities, but I hope you'll see them as we go along uh, in this presentation. So I guess, okay, so um, I want to encourage all of you, any of you, to ask questions as we go on. So anytime, just raise your hand and ask a question or call out. So I've organized this presentation as sort of a virtual field trip. I didn't really know what people were interested in particularly, so I said, well, I'll just sort of go to different places that I think are important and that interest me and they can become topics for discussion. Uh, first, though, I want to talk about geologic time. I'll just say a few words about it because that is the concept, I think, in earth sciences that people have the most difficulty with. And I'll tell you, as you become a professional earth scientist, geologist, um, your concept of change really changes. I mean, if you think that uh, 100 years is a long time, forget it. <laughs> uh, and so we do talk about geologic time differently, and we think about it than uh, so many other professions. One example of that is, is 50 million years a long time? 50 million years, well, maybe. It's only 1% of Earth history. So you're just starting to think about time. So, so that's one thing I want to, uh, and I have a geologic column that sort of shows that. The length of this column, the vertical height of it, is the, a oops, I'll get this. So we start from today up here, and 4.5 or 4.6 billion years would be the age of the Earth. So that's how old the Earth is. In New Mexico and in the Southwest, we see about this much of it, almost two billion years of time. There are rocks exposed for that length of time somewhere in the Southwest. In New Mexico, for example, up in the Sangre de Cristos, we have rocks that are over a billion years right there. So yeah, a billion years is beginning to be a long time. Even a geologist calls that old rocks. Mostly what I want to talk about today is just sort of in this upper part of things right in here. But if, uh, but if you have questions about other things, then we'll, we'll get to it. I do. So this is, this puzzles me. If the Earth is four and a half billion years old, I presume New Mexico has been around forever. Why don't our rocks represent four and a half billion years? Well, that's a really good question, and we can talk about it more later, but I'll give you the short answer right now. The Earth's crust has formed in pieces over long periods of time, and probably the original crust has been, was destroyed during bombardments and things like that. So it's formed in pieces. It's still forming today. And in the North American craton, if you go up to, uh, let's say, Canada, that's, those rocks up there are very old. Some of them are approaching four billion years old. 
but the crust was formed in successive stages this direction. So good question. It's not, the rocks that we see at the surface are not necessarily four billion years old. Yeah, good. Okay, so that's geologic time. Now, um, the other, another important concept is the land surface that you see and that we deal with and everything, what we call the physiography, the shape of the Earth's surface, can be much different in age from the rocks that are on it or in it. For example, um, if mountains are uplifted and they're made of very resistant rocks, they'll stay there and I can say, okay, those mountains over there are a billion years old, rocks are, but the ground surface here could be just a few million years old. So when we talk about the age of the rocks, it is, can be very different from the age of the surface, the physiography that we're dealing with. And I, this slide will show you a little bit about that. This is New Mexico, you recognize that. I'll master this before the talk is over, I'm sure. Okay, so here's New Mexico, the state of New Mexico. And it's been divided not by geologists, because the geology doesn't always correspond. It's been divided by physiographers into these names that may be familiar, the, the Great Plains. Here it's labeled Southern High Plains, but it's part of the Great Plains that extend all the way to the Mississippi River. And that's characterized by fairly thick crust and has generally been very stable. You do get small earthquakes here and there, but really not too much has happened to it. And those rocks that, are, that form the upper crust are really only a few hundred million years old. Then New, New Mexico is divided by what we call the Rio Grande Rift. And I have another diagram later that'll show that better. But what we call a rift is a place where the Earth's crust has been pulled apart and broken in the middle in a series of faults. And <clears throat> it's generally a low area and not so stable necessarily. And of course these mountains are you recognize the Rocky Mountains, they're a relatively late feature too. The Colorado Plateau, which extends over quite a large region here, part of it's in New Mexico. It's a piece of the Craton, it's a piece of what's now the Great Plains that's been broken off and rafted away, been broken off by the rift. Um, and then we have the, this big, massive volcanic field down here, the Mogollon Datil volcanic field. It is, it's a series of super volcanoes but it's an older area, it's about, these were formed mostly between 35 and 25 or 20 million years ago. So it's pretty eroded. And now it's mainly, a, when you go up there, it's beautiful territory, but it's mainly a high plateau, kind of rolling with canyons, but it's, the rocks there are, you know, 25, 30 million years old. And where's that? This is, um, well, for example, Silver City would be somewhere down in here. This is in the southwestern part of the state. The Gila Wilderness. The Gila. It's just a gorgeous place. Where is Santa Fe on this? Good point. I should have. <laughs> okay. I'm glad we have a great audience here. Here are the Jemez Mountains right here. These are the southern part of the Sangre de Cristo. So Santa Fe is right in here. Albuquerque would be right about here, this range to the east is the Sandia Mountains. And you see that they uh, kind of come down the sides of the Rio Grande Rift in bits and pieces. And then down here, when we get toward, uh, so Socorro would be roughly in the middle of the state, probably right in about here. And Las Cruces is down here and El Paso down here. Um, the mountains, the main mountains here, pretty much bound the flanks of the rift, and I'll have more to say about that also. But what I do want to point out is the physiography, uh, in, and in some cases the rocks are different in all of these different volcanic provinces, but the most active area of New Mexico is up and down the rift, and of course the rift continues way down into Mexico and into West Texas before we lose it, all the way to Big Bend. Big Bend, you still have these valleys that are, uh, and the valleys are broken, they're formed by faults. And the basin and range, this extends, there's only a piece of it here in, in New Mexico, 
but of course it comprises southern Arizona and Nevada and so forth. The Basin Range is a big physiographic province. Lots of faults active today. So what is a rift? I've given you a quick explanation already, um, but here's a, here's a block diagram that sort of explains what it is. The outer part of the Earth is called the crust. You probably know that. And its thickness is anywhere between 40 miles and, and 15 or something like that. But on continents, it's usually a little bit thicker than under oceans. And the crust is relatively cool, and it's therefore brittle. And so it's easily pulled apart by plate tectonic effects or even by uh, circulation in the mantle below it. Below the crust is what we refer to as the mantle. And it, uh, is, it extends anywhere from 35 kilometers, 30, 20 miles or so, down under southern New Mexico to uh, a couple of hundred kilometers down. And it's, it includes a little bit of partial melt. So many of the volcanic melts that come up uh, originate here in the upper mantle, in fact, pretty much all of them. What's, what's important here, though, is when you have extension, and extension can form for a lot of reasons, like, like breaking the crust of a candy bar, right? You get this nice chocolate coating on it, and you pull it apart, and it breaks in flakes and pieces, but the middle part, which is nougat, is sort of sticky. That's how the earth breaks apart, too. When it does, you form faults like these, and we have lots of lots of faults. The mountain ranges, the sandias, the Sangre de Cristos and so forth are parts of these uplifted shoulder pieces. The reason that we have a river, the Rio Grande, flowing through New Mexico is it has gotten itself, not surprisingly, into this valley. It's actually a series of valleys, and it's caught in there. And so that's why the river is where it is. And of course, for reasons that this shows pretty well, uh, you have these faults, and you have hotter material down here. Often, <laughs> rifts are places where we have volcanoes, or even just on the flanks sometimes of <laughs> rifts. So you find often lots of volcanoes. And in New Mexico, we have lots of young volcanoes and more probably still to come. Oh, yeah, let me back up here. This is a picture of Albuquerque, probably the South Valley, and it kind of shows now, of course, rifts, low places, are always places where you get lots of sediment flowing into them. So the sediments have created a nice flat valley floor, but the rocks that are exposed up on the flanks of the mountains, like on top of Sandia Crest, really are down here somewhere underneath these sediments that fill the, fill the, the rift valley. They're down here. So that's, they're separated by a lot more distance than just the height of the mountains. You think in Albuquerque about 5,000 feet for the sediment? Uh, probably at least, yeah. There's, there's probably several kilometers, a couple, two, three miles of structural offset beneath parts of Albuquerque, especially around Bernalillo, yeah. Yes, there's a, the, the topographic relief between the valley here and Sandia Crest is really only about 5,000 feet, so there's two or three or four times that structural offset. Yeah, so that's what a rift is. And of course, as you pull apart anything, the flanks sort of rise. And that's why and they back tilt. They tilt away from, uh, from the, uh, the valley. And you see that like Sandia crest. Here is a similar picture from uh, the Caballo Mountains, a little bit to the south. And as you see in many places along uh, along the rift, you see them on Sandia Crest, you actually see them in the, San, in the Sangre de Cristos too. The main part of the, the range is really ancient rocks, a billion years or older in most cases, with a little bit of the limestone on top, which is around 300 million years old, and underlies a much broader region, but the fact that the mountains have raised up like that is what exposes those uh, sedimentary rocks. So that's a very common thing to see. And that's what forms the rind of the watermelon on the Sandia Mountains. 
the San Luis Valley, this is also in the rift. And a lot of, probably many of you, or all of you maybe, have seen the uh, Rio Grande Gorge here, and people think, that's the rift. Oh, I understand a rift. Well, that's not really the rift. That's in the rift. But the rift is really this entire valley. That's the floor of the valley of the rift. And here are some of the flanks to the west, the Tusis Mountains, and off to the east would be the Sangre de Cristos, and these are volcanic volcanoes, small volcanoes to the north. So this is really a cool picture. And so if you see the Rio Grande Gorge, you can say, well, we're in the rift, but it's just a gorge cut through all those basalts, all those lavas. And if I use some of these terms, you just have to raise your hand and say, what does that mean? Okay, so <clears throat> why are rifts important? And I, I dwell on it a little bit because they are important. Well, one of the big reasons is rifts often are where the water is. Water flows to the low places, it gets collected there. And if you look at the three largest cities in New Mexico, where are they? They're in the rift. Santa Fe, Albuquerque, Las Cruces, and so on and so forth. That's where much, much, probably most of the settlement is, is in the rift. And that's where so many of the ancient peoples lived too is in or on the flanks of the rift where there was water. Um, another reason is because rifts are low places. You get all these sediments washing in, and you get gravels and sands, which make great aquifers. So rifts are often places where you have good groundwater aquifers. Minerals are typically exposed in the escarpments because you're looking at different rocks on the flanks, older rocks. So that's often where the minerals are, and mineral companies know that. Um, yeah, we preserve older rocks beneath rift sediments, and they're often better preserved than those on the flanks just because they're buried. So often we need to look at the older rocks or want to look for the older rocks or oil companies know to look in the older rocks for their resources. So rifts are often places for exploration. And the same thing for, that's often where energy resources are concentrated either in or along the flanks of rifts because the faulting will carry deeper groundwater, which is often hot. And so uh, many times they are places for geothermal resources. All right, now let's go look at... Uh, Things. So here's an example of the Great Plains to the east. And I know you've probably, most of you have seen there. You drive through it a lot. But we, um, generally it's flat. It can be rolling with canyons cut in it. But it's, it's old core North America. The rocks underneath are a billion years old and older. And you get layers of sedimentary rocks dominantly buried. So there's not much action not much faulting, not much mountain building within the, within the Great Plains or anything like that. And so that's, that's, that's that physiographic province. These mountains, by the way, are the uh, eastern part of the flank, flank uplift along the Rio Grande Rift. They're not way out on the Great Plains. Okay. By contrast, the Colorado Plateau, lots of action here. Same, part, same kind of crust is you find on the Great Plains, but it's thinner. And it hasn't been battered up too much, but there's been a little bit of deformation on the Colorado Plateau and volcanism. Here, for example, is shiprock, which is around 25 million years old or so, and it's the throat of an old volcano. So the vent, and it probably did vent, would be up here above the peak somewhere. When we see all of this, it's what's left when you've eroded the softer ground away, uh, away from it. The, these rocks here are much more resistant to erosion. So you basically just lowered the ground surface all around it. That's why it's still standing. And that's a good example of what I mentioned earlier, that the physiography is very different from the, uh, from the age of the rocks. Here is, um, now I can't think of it, the uh, Bistai. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and it's a great place because, again, it's on the Colorado Plateau, so it's been broadly eroded. But these rocks are about 
50 to 70 million years old, depending on exactly where you are. And they're being exposed by erosion. You can see dominantly they're flat-lying rocks and get these funny hoodoos wherever they, uh, you get a, something that's a little more resistant to erosion. It protects a column of rock beneath it. But again, we, the rocks exposed on the Colorado Plateau, some places deeply eroded by the, Rio, by the Colorado River or tributaries, and so you get this beautiful landscape and there's more action there because it's been elevated. It's already, the average elevation of the Colorado Plateau is about 6,000 feet. But as you know, it can range up to 10,000 feet or higher when you get over there in uh, Utah, uh, Nevada, along the edge of the... Uh, Can you explain the different colors? The different colors, it's almost always due to iron. And when you get a hydrated iron, like limonite or gertite or something like that, it's yellower. When you get redder colors, it's really a, it's, it's rust. Basically, it's iron oxide, just, just literally like rust. Uh, and some of this red, some of this red is um, chalcedony, it's just silica, SiO2. It often takes a reddish color because of impurities in it. And some of it, if you go out to the bisti, is clinker because there are a lot of coal layers in this rock, and many of them have burned naturally. The coal seams have burned. Coal seams will burn for hundreds of years, and you get this stuff that looks like a, lots of pebbles and things all heated together, stuck together, and it's clinker. In fact, this area was all scheduled to be ripped up for coal mines. Fortunately, got saved. Okay. So let's move on to uh, volcanism. I showed you that rifts are often places where we get volcanic rocks, lots of them. Here is the rift now extending from central Colorado. Actually, it extends even further northward, becomes narrower and narrower. But this map shows it from central Colorado all the way down through New Mexico, steps around like this, and all the way down into Texas and Mexico. So the yellow represents the young rocks, the sediments in the rift, the brown rock, are the ancient rocks like the Sangre de Cristos, the here, the Sandia, well, he, let's start again. Uh, these would be part of the Sangres right here. They run up here, and this is the front range. The Sandias and the Manzanos and so forth here, and then we have other pieces sticking up through here. And, but the purple rocks are all volcanic rocks, and they're all youngish. Young means, um, mostly less than 15 million years here in this particular diagram, but there are older ones. Many of them are within the rift, but interestingly here in this rift, many of them run obliquely to it, and that's its own story. But when you're in here, for example, this is the Jemez Mountains, and then the Cerros del Rio, the little group of volcanoes just west of Santa Fe. And Albuquerque volcanoes are uh, Right in here, they're just a little, tiny little volcanic field. I'm going to show you some of these volcanic fields. We'll take a look at this. We'll take a look at the Jemez. We want to look at Carrizozo volcanic flow here, too. That was a flow that's around 10,000 years old. And it probably flowed on for probably 20 or 30 years or more, just a little bit at a time, oozing down the valley. Really interesting thing. So let's start with the Albuquerque volcanoes, just because probably most of you are familiar with them. They're a bunch of one-shot deals, we call them. <laughs> you get one shot maybe for a few months or maybe a year or two. It would form a, vol uh, it would form a volcano. Um, and usually a lava flow. A lava flow would go in different directions. Sometimes, if you're there and walk around, you can see them. But in, uh, but they're now covered pretty much with soil and so forth, and so you don't really notice them so much. There's a whole series of them along, uh, aligned along a couple of different fractures. So you know that there's fracture control or perhaps a fall to depth. They probably went on and spattered for, a, who knows, maybe a decade or so. We don't really know how long it took for them to, to erupt, but they, um, kind of splattered away, and probably never, ever, any of them will erupt again. 
So it's what's most common in New Mexico and all through the Southwest. You get these sort of cinder cone fields. They're often called cinder cones or spatter cones because you get lots of groundwater that's entrained in the mouth and it throws up the cinders. And it's probably like a sheet-like dike of um, lava coming up to the surface. And then it'll never erupt again. Then we have Carrizozo flow that I mentioned. The source of it, there are two separate vents back here. And it flowed on for decades. And the, you get a series of flows because it erupted in pulses. And one would flow out, the next one would flow on top of it and perhaps go a little further. And so it's quite a dramatic feature. Uh, uh, five to 6,000 years old, as best it can be dated, it's not very well dated even yet. It's hard to, sometimes to date these young lava flows. This is a fairly iron and magnesium rich kind of, ma of uh, lava that we call basalt. And it's um, fairly fluid. So when it's hot enough and the slope is steeply, steep, it will flow almost like water. And it'll form these very typical what we call ropes of flow, like, like pouring molasses sometimes on a flat surface. You get these ropes if it's sticky, very characteristic. Here is another basalt lava flow out at Grants. If you haven't been there, it's a great place to go. It does involve a bit of a walk. Uh, it's called, um, generally the region's knowing, known as El Malpais or as ranchers say, El Malapai. Whenever a rancher here says El Malapai or something, you know he's talking about a, probably a basaltic lava flow. They called it bad land, they couldn't ride their horses in it. If the cattle get into it, they probably stay there a long time. And it formed, this particular flow formed a, a lo, uh, lava tubes. As lava channels open up and flow, often they'll roof themselves over. It's very efficient for them in a way because it keeps the heat in and then they, the lava can flow much further. And there's around 20 some miles of lava tubes in just this part of uh, El Malpai. It's now a national monument, it's public land. Often the roofs of these tubes will collapse. And that's what's happened in this case. I'm, I'm standing in the lava channel itself in a place where the whole top has collapsed and all the blocks you see in the foreground are the pieces that have fallen off into it. But what's so interesting is it's a big tube. You could put a house in there. And along the sides of this, I don't have photographs here, but along the sides of the tube, if you were to turn around and look in the other direction, there are more of these collapses. But you can see what we call bathtub rings too, which represent different levels of flow. Flow would probably the last time the a pulse of lava went through it, it'll form crystals and try to begin to roof over and then the level will fall and it'll form another ring and you can see those very prominently. Does the tube go up and down or horizontal? These are horizontal. horizontal. Yeah, these are, um, they're, they're, well, um, 50 feet. You can sort of judge by this one person standing off and looking into the abyss. <laughs> um, it is, if you get yourself down in here, it's very difficult to walk among all these blocks, but some spelunkers often go into these lava tubes and some of them go for miles. There's a whole flora and fauna of its own in these tubes. Okay, so um, here's another kind of volcano. I don't want to say too much about it because I'm already probably running out of time. But this is Kilburn Hole. And this was driven not so much by lava, there was lava down there, but by gas. It's a deep, it's something that's situated from very deeply, probably had a huge amount of water in the magma and also carbon dioxide. So it blew a hole and you get a lot of uh, ash and so forth around the sides of it but it didn't really uh, create much in the way of lava flows. It's down by uh, Las Cruces. But what it did do was it pulled up pieces of the Earth's mantle. And you see this green rock here, it's not really that big. It's mainly olivine, the main component of this 
kind of rock is olivine. And you can come up later and see these. I have two samples here of basaltic rock with one of these, we call them xenoliths. A xenolith comes from the Greek, I guess, meaning a strange rock, something that's out of place in the rock which hosted it. But when you know the size of these things, and of course then you can look at the weight of them and, uh, and so forth compared to the melt, they're heavier than the melt. They come from the mantle. They're dominantly olivine. There's a pyroxene, there's two pyroxenes in them, and then usually uh, some aluminous phase like spinel or sometimes garnet if they come from very deep. Uh, they're gorgeous and people have studied them very thoroughly really to understand the Earth's mantles. One way we can learn about what the mantle is made of, the deeper part of the Earth. So I invite you later to come up and, and certainly look at these. You're certainly welcome to handle them, but they're heavy, very heavy, so be careful. Also, I, hadn't, I probably won't say too much about it, but the rock in the middle is a piece of the lower part of the crust of the Earth. So it has a different chemistry, different chemical composition. But from studying the size and weight of these xenoliths and so forth, uh, we can uh, estimate the flow, the, the, the upward rate of flow of these lavas too. And it, basically any of these eruptions that we see like the Albuquerque volcanoes or Mal, the, any of the Malapai uh, fields, they'll come up in a matter of days to a week or two from, from let's say 30 miles down. They, I don't know if that's fast or slow to you, but to me it's pretty fast for those things to come up. Okay, so finally let's move on to um, the Hamas. You recognize this. This is the big kid on the block. It's a super volcano. And it is, um, it was a real disaster at the time that it erupted. This whole thing here is the Hemis Mountains with Valles Caldera, that's the actual collapse feature from which the eruption occurred. And, um, and the, the snow, of course, in this photograph really emphasizes the valley quite well. These various domes, these are lava domes that erupted after the main eruption and collapse of the crater. I have a figure that'll show you that. The flanks of the mountain, all of this area here, almost, almost all the way around it like this, is uh, these ash deposits that erupted. And, and originally, the, uh, initially in one of these eruptions, probably the plume of ash and gas will reach the stratosphere and go around the whole earth. This one certainly did. Um, but much of it, as the, as the plume collapses, then you get this hot ash that rolls down the slopes of the volcano, and those are enormously destructive. That's what wiped out Pompeii and other places like that. They can be very hot, 600 degrees. They can move very fast, certainly uh, 50, 60 miles an hour. They'll go over topography. They'll take out everything, and they can go for miles and miles. No, good question, very good question. <laughs> Thanks for asking that. Um, the Hemas volcanic field is this whole thing, and it's been building for uh, probably at least 15 million years. We know that because some of the older rocks in there we can date. And uh, as it was building, de it depends on the rate at which the melt is coming from the mantle. If it's coming very fast, it'll build one big, erupt one big chamber. It's like blow, if you can imagine blowing up a balloon before the air can get out, a leaky balloon. If you can blow it up really fast, I mean, there are no such things because when balloons break, they're catastrophic. So but it's again? I don't know if it's growing again. I'll, I'll come to that. But it has erupted twice already in these big Yellowstone type eruptions. This is a super volcano. It's not quite as big as Yellowstone, but it's one of a number on Earth. I'll, I'll show you more about this. So here's another kind of a physiographic map of it right here from a different angle. And you can see, again, here's the collapsed part of it. And then since that time, probably there was a ring fracture 
ring-shaped fracture along which the cork essentially collapsed. And then you get uh, later, a few million, a few th thousands to hundreds of thousands of years later, you get various small eruptions that come up along that ring. And in some cases, and it is true of the Hemez, the floor of it will push back up too. So that has happened in this case. Um, I guess I'm, I should hurry here. But anyway, that's what's happened. And this is how one of these forms. You get a shallow magma chamber, which means it probably has to, you have to have a lot of filling material quickly. You build a volcanic edifice like that. It never was quite this big over the Hemez. And then at some point, it begins to collapse. Basically, it means that the roof, the rock roof, the shallow crust is not strong enough to support the weight any longer of the volcano up here. And as, as you partially empty it, it begins to collapse. And probably it collapses simultaneously with eruption. And then eventually, you run out of steam. You run out of molten rock. You run out of water, which is driving the whole process in a way. And then in many cases, Crater Lake Oregon would be one small example. You'll form a crater lake in there. We know that Valles Caldera here had one or several lakes over a period of time. It would, you'd, you'd have a lake, probably build a dam or something, and it would break the dam and flow out. And then there were two or three lakes in there over a period of time. Now erosion has cut back in far enough that there is no lake. Why, why did the magma, magma sink when you suck it from the top? It's because, it's because you're evac this eruption evacuates the magma chamber. Oh. It's like taking a soda bottle shaking it up, and I've done this with teachers, you, you offer to let them open it and kind of point the bottle toward them a little bit. You know what's gonna happen. The water in the soda bottle is full of gas. As soon as you get any kind of leak coming up from the chamber, you begin to break the rock, the steam leaks out, and, you, and then the lava starts coming in. You get a huge eruptive plume, which just doesn't really show. But it's, uh, yeah, you just evacuate the thing. Let me move along here. So what's happening there now under Valles Caldera? Some years ago, I and a number of people, we had support from DOE, we had support from the laboratory, we had support from the National Science Foundation, the US Geological Survey, did a series of um, seismic experiments where we put out instruments, recording instruments, and listened to natural earthquakes. That's what these are supposed to be, earthquake rays coming in. And basically, I'll make it really simple here just to keep it, just to keep moving here, but you can, you can measure, what you're actually measuring is the arrival time. You know that an earthquake has happened over in the Pacific Ocean, for example, or someplace like that. You measure the time exactly of when each instrument records that wave. And when you do that, you can then back calculate the velocity of the wave. Where the velocity is slow, that indicates that the, you have, the, the waves have intercepted uh, hot rock or even molten rock. Where it's faster, you missed it. And so we did that, and the result was we had three areas of slow waves. One near the very surface, which was a caldera fill with all the landslide and every, all the stuff in it. That was about 17% low. We had a big region here, which was about 23, 25, in some places even slower percent low. And so the only thing that makes sense to slow up the seismic waves that much is melt. Rock type alone won't do it. And then we have some down here, which could be melt or it could be intrusions of basalt at the, at the interface between the mantle and the crust. So that, and for a number of other reasons, we think that it's a dormant volcano. It's not extinct. It's dormant. It probably will erupt again. And actually, here's another argument for it here. My colleagues who have been working there a lot recently. Um, oh, so let me just tell, tell you a little bit about the timing. These eruptions, these two big caldera forming eruptions occurred 1.6 and 1.2 million years ago. These were the big eruptions. But the caldera has, has erupted at least 25 times since then. 
small eruptions, little ash flow events, domes and things. So there's no reason to think it isn't going to erupt again. <laughs> and the repose time between, the latest was 4,000 years ago, 40,000 years ago. But it's been doing that for a million and a, uh, 1.2 million years. So when's the next one going to be? Well, you decide. <laughs> we don't know. We do know that it's most likely to erupt again. There will be precursory symptoms, certainly. There'll be uh, probably small earthquakes. There'll be steam vents. There will be a warning, but it would be a bad thing. It will be a bad thing when it happens, even if it's just a small one. You get a big plume of ash and so forth, at least. So there's, we think there's magma there now. It doesn't mean that it's capable of erupting. If there's only a little bit of melt and lots of crystals, it's very, very sticky. It probably won't erupt. Okay, so let me switch um, to faults. Does anybody know where this is? Have you seen this photo? La Bajada. It's great. It's a great photo. It's a very interesting place. This is the old road. This is the old Camino Real, El Camino Real, after it was improved. And you can still drive it, or you could last time I tried it. It's not easy. Um, but my point in doing this is to, it's a place where all of us, of course, the, the modern highway is a couple of miles south. And you notice it, especially in winter, but it's not like it was. But there's something like 600 feet of offset from the top of La Bajada Mesa to the ground at the bottom. So, okay, that's a lot, maybe. But we've done enough work out there, off, pretty much with students, doing seismic work, we know that there's really structurally, there's, there's about 10,000 feet of offset of any given layers along that fault. That, that escarpment represents just the top part of the La Bajada Fault. And so 10,000 feet, of course, what's happened with the river there, the lower part of it has been filled. And when you make a hole that deep, of course, it's filling constantly. But there's 10,000 feet of offset along the La Bajada Fault right at that point. So it's been a major fault. It's one of these faults that creates the rift basins. So what happens when you get faults? You get earthquakes. <clears throat> so what, one of the things, a lot of people think we don't have earthquakes here in this part of New Mexico. I want to disavow you of that notion. We do get earthquakes. We haven't had any really, really big ones that I know of since, you know, in historic times. But there have been quite a number, including in 1918, there was a magnitude five or so, as best we can estimate, in Cerritos. In Dulce, in 1963, there were a series of small earthquakes and one substantial one that's estimated now at between magnitude 5 to 5.5. Not big by California standards, but we're not at the edge of a plate here either. We're in the middle of a plate. And this is sort of character, characterization of places like rifts and it's characteristic of places like rifts where you uh, have lots of faults. And of course, if you have lots of small ones like twos and threes and fours, which we do, and fives and six, which we occasionally do, means you're at risk for seven, too, seven and higher. And they're the ones that begin to get serious. So this is the area of, just to show you where we are here, this is the Colorado, New Mexico border right here. Farmington, I think, is right there. Durango is right there. I put the letters on bigger because this map as it was published was kind of hard to read. Durango's there, Chama is there, Dulce is dead center. There's Los Alamos somewhere in here, and Santa Fe's down here. So really, people here probably didn't perceive it. It did, it wasn't a huge earthquake, but it did some damage. So, yeah, 1966, January 23rd, and I think it was kind of late in the day. And just to show you this for fun, this is one kind of earthquake wave. This is a surface wave <laughs> that just uh, travels along the surface. These are the ones that shake a lot. Um, 
And so if this were your house right here, watch how it moves sideways and up and down. And that does a lot of damage to houses. That's called a love wave. It's a kind of surface wave. There are various kinds. Okay, so earthquakes ca can and do happen here. This was a kind of a crappy picture taken in 1966 by a fellow from, I think, the Colorado, Arizona, the, Arizona, the Colorado Geological Survey. Got down here really quick and, and uh, interviewed a lot of people and looked at some of the damage. This looks to me like a store. And it's probably characteristic of the kind of damage that it did. It damaged almost every house in Dulce and, and the schools for some reason in particular. But you can see all these cans and so forth, probably lots of broken bottles and so forth. No deaths. So, but it wasn't a big earthquake, but it was a good one. Socorro is pretty much the earthquake capital of New Mexico. Lots and lots of earthquakes often. They get swarms of earthquakes. Um, there, there's a history of earthquakes all the time. In 1906, there, were, there, were, there was a whole series of earthquakes that happened. The three biggest ones are shown here. Magnitude 5 point, almost 5.6, 5.8, and then a 6.2. That's getting to be serious. And it did some damage. This is the courthouse and the Masonic Lodge. And if you look at it, you can see here's a wall that broke out um, and part of the roof collapsed. There's certainly been collapse in part of this building here to knock down chimneys. And it did various things like that. And of course, masonry buildings are the worst kind. That's why the codes for putting steel in masonry buildings are as strict as they are. And adobe is probably the very worst. So, uh, but a magnitude six earthquake it will do damage if it's at all close to the surface. So, and uh, certainly Socorro has had a lot of uh, earthquakes since that time, small ones. They happen almost all the time. And the reason, I don't have any slide for it, but let me tell you the reason that we think it's happening. We think there's active intrusion of magma happening now, coming up. Part of it may be plating out at, uh, at a depth of, uh, I have to convert all these from kilometers to miles, but 15 miles down in some places is probably shallower. And what geologists think, and I'm always skeptical of things <laughs> real hard, but um, I think it's probably right that there's a growing intrusion in the upper crust now of a basaltic melt, probably a magma of some sort. Comes up a little at a time over a period of time there's a lot of reasons for thinking that there uh, could be volcanism there in the future. Okay, one of the things I forgot to say at the beginning is I, I want to really give you a feeling for we do live in a dynamic environment here. I mean, the rift, the Colorado Plateau and so forth. And I've talked about earthquakes and volcanoes. But another thing to think about, I think about this a lot, is the climate has changed a lot too. I don't mean short term, I mean long term, since the Ice Age. And if you look at uh, central New Mexico here, and this is true all over the West, places where we don't have water now used to be wonderful lakes, nice beaches, good vegetation, lots of animals, humans living there and so forth. And this shows the area down by White Sands. Why is White Sands there even? Well, White Sands is on the shore of this former lake, uh, Lake Lucero. And it was a closed basin. The water that ran into it couldn't get out, so it just evaporated. And it made these fabulous gypsum formations. The gypsum is now caught up. In fact, it's here's a, somewhere I have a picture of it. Um, but the gypsum is being scoured by the wind now and piled up along the, sh the shores of uh, what we now call the White Sands. But we had lakes, beautiful lakes in the plains of San Augustine, out here by Lordsburg. That's why we get so much dust being picked up. Uh, it's, it's partly the, the very fine lake sediment. So when the wind blows a lot, like today, you can actually get brownouts on the interstate, not a good thing. Small lakes all through here and the Estancia area and so forth, and 
many, many other places, Arizona, California, Utah, Nevada, lots of these. And they were, uh, the climate really was quite different than much wetter, much cooler. We find these gl uh, glacial age animals. And we certainly know that uh, Clovis culture and Folsom culture people lived around these, not, not 30 million years ago, but, uh, but certainly 12 and 10 million years ago, for sure they did. So that, again, uh, we, climate is dynamic too, and it's a part of geological processes. Yeah, here's, here's a better view of, uh, okay, so Lake Lucero is the modern Playa Lake. Lake Otero was the previous lake and much bigger and certainly some deeper, not huge. Here's white sands in here and here's a picture of Lake Lucero at present day when it happens to have some water in it. <clears throat> but anyway, so um, yes, it's a great place and it really indicates just how much our climate has to do with our geological processes. And okay. <laughs> So, thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions. I, I know we've had a few during, that's great, but if you have anything now, now's your chance. Please feel free to come up and look at these rocks before you leave, at least. Be careful, if you, you can heft them, they're hands on, but don't drop them on your foot. <laughs> That'd be fatal. Uh, please. Can you say a little word about Yellowstone? Yellowstone and Long Valley, California, and the Jemez Mountains are three of, I think, only 10 or so big super volcano type volcanoes in the world today in the last million years. So, you know, when you think of, I didn't mention this, but the San Juan Mountains, or the mountains down by Silver, sea, Silver City, they're old calderas, and they're not uncommon on Earth, but they're 30 million years old, or 25. They're not going to erupt again. Yellowstone probably will. There's magma under there now. Long Valley has had its scares, as we know, with intrusions of, of uh, probably basaltic dikes coming up, but not erupting. And we think there's melt, under Valles Caldera now. So Long Valley is a bigger, it's the biggest of the three, for sure. And it has erupted three times and actually in um, kind of a succession. Valles Caldera, by contrast, has erupted twice so far, and they've been confocal sorts of eruptions. The, the big caldera collapses have occurred one on top of the other. Um, Yellowstone, what, what more did you want to know? I, <laughs> Okay, but there are, uh, there are other ones that, that are big. Toba volcano in the Philippines is a huge volcano. Um, they're not rare on Earth. Humankind has never seen an eruption that large, never. Things like even um, Mount St. Helens eruption or uh, on the Greek islands or what's the one... Uh, Krakatau, that's, thank you, that's what I was trying to think of. They were small potatoes. I mean, they were nothing. They were, I think Krakatau was something like one or two cubic kilometers of lava. Lias Caldera was probably at least 300, the two ash sheets together. So these are big guys. They affect global climate. It depends on how much sulfur they have. Some are worse than others. Sulfur seems to make the, have the greatest influence on, uh, on the temperature and so forth, but yeah. I have a general question. As climate change is increasing the volume and the weight of oceans, does this slightly affect the tectonic plates? That's a really good question. Um, I mean, it seems we're yeah. more earthquakes these days. So the question is, is the changing volume of the oceans, does it affect the plates? I'd probably say it the other way around. The plates are changing a lot just by their own driving mechanism, which is really negative buoyancy. They, they try to sink into the, into the deeper earth. 
And so on a long term, long time frame, probably they are what affect the volume of the ocean basins. And uh, you, it's not just the big plates, but you get little plates, even pieces of plates that change. And things like, I should answer another question here before I f forget about it too, because someone asked a different question that relates. But the plates, are, their relations are shifting a lot all the time on different time frames. So I don't really know the answer to that exactly, but the driving mechanisms, the heat flow, the turbulence of heat, the mantle convex on different scales too. So that affects things. What was the other a question about crust, crusts? Continental crust is formed in subduction zones. That's the biggest environment by which new crust forms. So as plates are subducted, basically the water is driven out of the rocks is what it amounts to. You get arcs of volcanoes. We call them, we call these lines of volcanoes like Central and South America. That's a magmatic arc. But you get them off in the oceans too, like in Japan and the Philippines. Those are arcs of volcanoes too. And all of that volcanism over periods of time, what's spectacular at the surface are the volcanoes. What you don't see underneath are the big magma chambers that never come up. That scene, and then you end up shoving them onto the, or against continental crust. That's where we form crust, and it's been happening, but we don't know how long, because we don't know when plate tectonics started, but it's been happening for two or three billion years at least on Earth. That was sort of related to the, the earlier question. Please. It's fracking. There's no question about it. I mean, there's, it's been well documented by the US Geological Survey. They've published it. Even the oil companies get that one. Yeah, and it comes from, from waste disposal, not fracking of wells has gone on for a long time, but not with the volume of water that's being, that's used now. So it, there's no question about it. Yeah. So it's not, sorry. One moment. So, It's also a big fault zone anyway. So I, I wouldn't doubt that perhaps oil and gas could have had something to do with that. I haven't ever seen that in print. It could be, I wouldn't argue against it. But it is a big uh, zone. It's a continuation of the zone that comes up the west side of the Sierra Nascimento, which is probably the second most active earthquake zone in New Mexico, and it really doesn't, that doesn't have to do with earthquakes, because if you look at the epicentral locations, they're in a narrow belt right along the west side. And that has to do with pulling apart again of what had been a, an area that had been pushed together, that threw up the nascimientos, but now it's pulling apart. And so it's very active, and Dulce is right on that same trend. It goes right up to Pagosa Springs. So that's what I know about that. So it's not directly the frack, the hydrofracking itself, but the disposal of the water that's been used for the fracking, right? For the storage and disposal in the earth and increasing the pressure and the flow pressure and the formation. That's right. So the question was, is it the actual fracking that causes all the earthquakes that we now read about and everything, or is it this disposal? The fracking itself is very, um, I'm not sure what the pressures are, but it really, you can see it with sensitive seismometers. You can go in there and you can see these magnitude minus one and minus two and zeros and ones and two uh, magnitude, but they don't do much. The fracks themselves, the fractures are not very long. Um, they're not gonna last that long for one thing. Um, but th what they know is just by, people have studied them. We've had, there's been a student at the laboratory who have studied them and you can, you can see the distribution of the earthquakes. They always center around the disposal wells. And you can relate it in some cases to the actual pumping event itself too. So there's, there's a lot more coming about that. But I think, yeah, so it's, it's mainly the disposal of the water 
that's doing it, those powerful pumps, really putting the water, large, large volumes of water. And large volumes under pressure or just large volumes? Under pressure. Under pressure for disposal. Yeah, yes.